Here's a question for you. What's the most down and out that you've ever been? I'm asking this because the main character in this book that we're covering on this episode, running through Beijing at the very start on the first page, I think it's the first page, has just left prison and he's got a tiddly amount of money to his name and he doesn't have a place to stay. He has to figure out from the very first second that he's out the prison gates where he's going to sleep, where he's going to get more money. I'm lucky enough to have been never anywhere close to that at all, although I can think of in the back of my head the most down and out I've ever been. I could pinpoint that moment in my life. So I just wonder if you could do the same and probably for some of us that situation that you've pinpointed will be much more dire than for others. So that little, I don't know if thought experiment's the right word, but that's what I'll call it anyway. So that thought experiment aside, I'm going to take us to the news segment of this show, the truth of fake news, before we go to the interview with this book's translator, Eric Abrahamson. So our first news item, this is something you can watch. It's a discussion uh, between two translators talking about a book I believe they jointly translated or one of them did I you know what I'm not even gonna fact check that but two translators discussing Lu Min's Dinner for Six the two translators in question are multiple time show guest Nikki Harmon and friend of the pod Helen Wong so if if you want to just hear two translators chat it's up on YouTube it's on the Balestier or Balestier, whatever, press YouTube channel. They have quite a lot of videos discussing uh, translated Chinese books that they've published. And it's, I think, a little bit uh, underexplored. I noticed the view counts for a lot of their books aren't all that high. So do check out that, well, if it interests you, do check out this sort of in-conversation thing between Nikki and Helen about Lumin's novel and explore the rest of the channel because there's a, you know, there's a treasure trove of translated Chinese lit stuff there. And Ballestier Press, Ballestier? Ballestier? I don't know. They're an amazing publisher. They're well worth your attention. So check that out. Okay, next news item. This is something that you could buy or possibly more likely borrow. There's a new uh, sort of academic tome relating to Chinese lit in translation on the way. I'm actually going to read this one's blurb assuming that blurb is not too long it's pretty hefty i'll <laughs> i'll introduce the book and start working through it and, and we'll see so this is the bloomsbury handbook of modern chinese literature in translation there's three editors cosima bruno lucas klein and chris song i've actually read one of chris song's books uh, i read it in prep for my master's dissertation wasn't awfully useful for the topic i picked but it was a very good read so, so you know, maybe, I don't know if that's a, that helps sell this Bloomsbury handbook. It's available for pre-order. I'm on the US site and it's $171. You save $19 by pre-ordering it online. So that indicates to me this is more, yeah, this is an academic book, academic pricing. The easiest way to get it will be through library, probably university library, academic access. So that's why I'm saying this is a borrow and not really a buy unless you are a library unless you are not really a human being but you are a corporate or institutional entity and probably if you're listening you probably are human so you would have to borrow the book let's read this blurb let's see where we go with it here we go offering the first systematic overview of modern and contemporary chinese literature from a translation studies perspective this handbook provides students researchers and teachers with the context in which to read and appreciate the effects of linguistic and cultural transfer in chinese literary works <gasps> translation matters it always has, of course, but more so when we want to reap the benefits of benefits of intercultural communication. In many universities, Chinese literature and English translation is taught as if it had been written in English. As a result, students submit what they read to their own cultural expectations. Semicolon. They do not read in translation and do not attend to the protocols of knowing, engagements and contestations that bind literature and society to each other. My goodness. The Bloomsbury Handbook of Modern Chinese Literature and Translation squarely addresses this pedagogical lack. <gasps> organized in tripartite oh, 
organized in a tripartite structure around considerations of textual, social, and large-scale spatial and historical circumstances, its 30-plus essays each deal with a theme of translation studies as emerged from the translation of one or more Chinese literary works. In doing so, it offers new tools for reading and appreciating modern and contemporary Chinese literature in the global context of its translation, offering in-depth studies about eminent Chinese authors and their literary masterpieces in translation. The first of its kind, this book is essential reading for anyone studying or researching Chinese literature in translation. And I'm interested to see if it mentions which authors are being translated. It tells you which authors have written each chapter. You can see former show guest Ji Dawei is in there, having written chapter 5 about queer translation. Er, I don't see any other like authors. Oh, Kara Healy, former show guest, is on there as well. And her chapter is on Chinese sci-fi, the success of Chinese sci-fi specifically. So that's cool. Well done, Kara, for getting that in there. Paul Be oh, and then chapter 11, former show guest Paul Bevan is in there too. Very cool. I can see as well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being silly here. Chapter 10, uh, it's the, the author is, a, I guess, a Korean um, academic working in a Korean university. So that's, that's the sort of guest I've never had on the show, is um, someone from somewhere else in East Asia that's not, you know, like China or a Sino uh, territory, like Hong Kong or Singapore. So that's, that, I, I find that an interesting perspective, I suppose. Uh, I'm still flicking through. Unfortunately... The authors covered don't really seem to be named. It's more about the types of literature that that fills me with sadness. Uh, not seeing. Oh yeah, Jin Yong. There's a chapter on Jin Yong's Condor Heroes by Shelley Bryant. Oh, there's one on uh, Zhang Ailing about uh, Aileen Chang's self translation. Very nice. And that's your lot. So this this genuinely sounds interesting. This is something I might read, but um, I might have to find a way to procure it through library access once it comes out. Anyway, that was a very hefty news segment. Uh, well, that was a very hefty segment of a news segment. I should now get to the last item. Oh yeah, this is something you can read. It's a self-translation. Funnily enough, I, you know, Aileen Chang and her self-translations came up. Um, this is a story published by Asian Cha, just on their, their website, their WordPress, and it's it's called a sailor on the ferry. It's by Jasmine, well, by and translated by Jasmine Tong, and it's a Hong Kong story. That's all I really know, but that's up there. Short story you can read, and it's bilingual actually. Um, it looks almost like a flash fiction. It seems to be really quite short, but yeah, the, it's uh, it's up in both languages, Chinese and the original. Yeah, the sorry, the original Chinese and also English. So yeah, that. That will be linked in the show notes along with the other news items. Just something for you if you want to get a little um, free bit of reading of some translated Chinese fiction. And it's from Hong Kong, which is, I mean, we've it feels like we've done Hong Kong a fair bit on the show recently. But in any case, it's a, it's a nice change from the usual mainland stuff. And you have a very mainland episode ahead, I dare to say. And, you know, on that note, we will march or we will run. We will run through Zhong Guansun into my interview with Mr. Eric Abrahamson. On the show, we have returning guest Eric Abrahamson. Eric, really exciting to have you back. It's been quite a while. Last time was the episode on Gofei, I believe, his flock of brown birds. Yeah. What have you been doing since then? Since then, ah, that was years ago. Um, let's see. Since then, if I hadn't moved back. Uh, to the United States at that point. I have since then. That was about end of 2016. So I've officially left China after about 16 years of living in Beijing. Um, not a moment too soon. Uh, I'm sort of glad that I went through COVID here in Seattle rather than back in Beijing. Mm -hmm. um, still translating, but I have actually made kind of a career shift to kind of doing software development. Um, so that's my day job now but still running Paper Republic, uh, still bringing out translations, as you can see um, from our topic of conversation today. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the gist of it. So for this episode, Eric, we're talking about running through Beijing because I've read it, but I hear there's another Beijing related book by the same author. Is that correct? It's just come out translated by or jointly translated by yourself? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Jeremy Tiang and I translated a collection of short stories 
um, brought out by the same publisher, Two Lines Press, as as did Running Through Beijing, also by Xu Jiechen. Um, and that is sort of a continuation of his themes of you know writing about young people trying to trying to survive on the outskirts of Beijing. So it's got a lot of the same recurring characters. Uh, same setting and obviously you know this has been sort of one of his big subjects of his writing career over the past 20 years or so cool this is a very pro jeremy tiang podcast perhaps the most i would dare to say the most pro jeremy podcast um so great to hear that you work with him on that one and just to be clear for the listeners that's a joint translation running through beijing that's just an eric translation right yeah that's right Cool. Um, so we, we, Jeremy and I sort of split up the stories in, in uh, Beijing Sprawl and um, we did, you know, each did our own stories and then edited each other and had lots of conversations about that. So it was a fun project, really, really a fun project. Awesome. So we've introduced yourself, your co-translator for Beijing Sprawl, although we're here to talk about running through Beijing. We heard a name in passing there, Shu Jiechen. Shu That's Zichen. the author. He did yep. a little old thing called writing the book in question. Uh, so <laughs> let's hear more about him. What does uh, Shu Lausche write? What sort of writing is it? And what can you tell about him, if anything? Yeah. Um, so he's sort of, he's one of the bigger names of kind of, uh, well, used to be the young generation of Chinese writers. Now, now it's sort of the, the middle generation of Chinese writers. I also used to be one of the young generation of translators and have edged into the middle generation of translators as well. Um, he's in his mid forties, uh, from Jiangsu, the Northern area of Jiangsu. And he moved to Beijing around, uh, well, the end of the nineties or the early two thousands to go to Tsinghua, uh, university, which is one of the most prestigious universities in the country. Uh, and he, let's see, I would say at that time, particularly in the beginning of his writing career, um, most of his fiction was focused on migrant workers not necessarily workers but migrants you know people who are coming to beijing uh to make their way in in the world and sort of in a sense that you know in a larger sense that he was coming to beijing to make his way in the world by going to a very very prestigious university uh, a lot of people were coming from his area of of the country to beijing not to go to a prestigious university mm. but instead to just do whatever the heck they could um, to find, you know, work as laborers or, you know, under the table work, employment, whatever it is that they could find in an attempt to, you know, improve their lives and uh, set themselves on a new course, change their fates, as they as they say. Mm. And so when he moved to Beijing, he kept in touch with a lot of the people that he used to know from his area of the, of the country uh, in northern Jiangsu, kept in touch with them, sort of followed their life stories. And that was kind of the first really big a chunk of subject matter for him as an author was to tell these people's stories, uh, describe what it was like to be on the sort of the the lower ranks of of Chinese society, uh, the edges of the city, and just their struggles as they try to make their way in the city. So that's that's the subject of both running Beijing uh, through Beijing and Beijing Sprawl. Um, there are sort of a recurring cast of characters of mostly young men, some young women, mostly young men, um, who are living on the edges of Beijing and trying to make their way. Uh, trying to just make enough money, trying to get their foot in the door, uh, trying to settle down. The ultimate goal for them is to become Beijingers, which is sort of the great, the holy grail of of any migrant worker, um, is to finally get residence permit to live in the city and to to call yourself a Beijinger. So he's you know his uh, over a twenty plus year writing career. Obviously, he's written about a, a ton of stuff, but I would say that you know these these characters and their stories are sort of the big the first big subject uh, that he worked with. Right. And some geography basics here. I probably most listeners will know these, but for any who don't, this could be handy stuff to talk about. A, a few things I've tried to make bullet points in my head as you were speaking. The first was the term migrant workers. So again, probably most listeners know this, but if you don't, that term in the context of China almost always means someone who's migrated from usually an interior province, but here not exactly because it's northern Jiangsu. So they've come from a poorer part of China and they've gone to a city, often one of the bigger, wealthier cities, and they're doing the shitty jobs no one else is doing, essentially. And the res like like you said, becoming a Beijinger is mega important because again, probably most of you listening know this, but if you don't, the residency permit, it's a quite a fundamental thing in China. It's called a hukou, and that determines your access to social services. I think that's as far as I'm aware, that's one of the really fundamental things about it. So if you're a migrant worker who's come to Beijing and you are not a Beijing resident, you don't have the Beijing hukou, 
your kids can't get into Beijing schools properly and you can't get a lot of the things that a normal Beijinger of the same economic standing as you could get. And that sort of keeps you shut out. So it's a big, big source of, it sort of goes hand in hand a little bit with the rural urban divide in China. Again, probably most of the people listening are saying, we know this, shut up, but I feel like <laughs> I have to say it. And I, I guess also I'd throw in as a bonus Jiangsu, as I know it, has a wealthy south that's near that Jiangnan area. I'm always trying to bring up on the show, where which was sort of more or less where I lived in my time in China. And then northern Jiangsu, you're more sort of in the sticks. Right. And I, and why they didn't just go to Shanghai since it was right there, um, hmm. you know, I don't know. Obviously, Xu Zhichun was going to attend college, but um, the yeah so internal internal migration is like a, it's a, an enormous thing it's sort of one of the big stories of modern chinese society uh, is these the movement of people into the cities and and their attempts to get a foothold there and yeah no you're right everyone listening to us already knows all this i just it did it, it we have there's so much talk here in the us about you know the green the visa to get in and then the green card uh to sort of like solidify your position and and the the huko is very much very much the the domestic green card sort of sort of thing once you got that you're you're good to go and nobody can you know nobody can mess with you so there's right. a lot in these stories there's a lot of like people avoiding the police there's a lot of people getting you know quote unquote deported uh back to where they came from and then coming back again so it really is it's all domestic it's all within one country but the dynamics are very much uh like you see with inter international migration in other parts of the world i kind of wonder if a reason if one was from northern Jiangsu and one had the option to go to Shanghai, but let's say for every reason your social your, your social network, the people that you know are more heavily stacked in Beijing, that might be one reason to go there rather than Shanghai. Like if people from your extended family or your pals from school, if it happened that they were in Beijing or if you have aunties or uncles or whatever, then even though it's further away, you've got a network and that in the in the absence of a state safety nets or access to social service social i don't know why i'm struggling with social services if that's not there at least you have a human network that you can connect with so you're not alone and it's just a guess but i think that's relevant for running through beijing because our our characters are they our main guy don huang he's fresh out of prison so he is coming from a sort of back to square one situation and it's like an initial connection with a friend that sort of gives him a, a roof over his head and an economic foothold, i.e. like a job or a, 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 a something that's going to secure him income that can then give him a way to get by and possibly keep climbing up the ladder from the bottom. I should say, by the way, I read this book, I think it's years ago now. I've not reread it since, so you might need to help me out a bit. Eric. Yeah, well, I mean, it was even longer ago that I translated it, so mm. we, we, we may be fumbling together here. But yeah, everything you're saying is uh, is very correct, and I think that, like in Beijing Sprawl, it's it's even made more explicit. There's actual gang warfare in Beijing among um, between people from different parts of the country. So everybody from you know a certain province gangs up together, and th yeah, there's a lot of sort of mutual aid um, and and help, but also rivalry f between the people from diff different areas. So there's that identity is very strong. Wow. It sounds like it could almost be a story from the late Qing or something. Different some guys. you know, some things have changed, some things haven't. So. On on a note uh relating to me not having read this thing in a while, to save myself, I went over to Goodreads to read some different reviews. That often is a quick uh -huh. way to one, see what the readers thought, but two, someone on creative usually writes a review that's just a plot summary. Which suits right. me nicely. Um, <laughs> but I think I noticed is I had to hit the translate button on Goodreads because lots of reviewers from different languages were leaving their things on on running through Beijing. And for whatever reason, Goodreads put all the language editions on the one Together. entry. Right. So I noticed a lot of uh, Arabic reviews, actually, Arabic, English, and I think German. And there may have been more, but by that point, I'd homogenize them all into google english so but yeah loads of arab readers it seems that's interesting so they must have a i must have an arab language translation i don't imagine that they're all reading uh they're all reading the english probably not it, 
I don't know that much about the the Middle East, but I I wouldn't be surprised at all if you know internal migration and the and the question of you know finding a foothold in a precarious society is very much uh, a current issue in those countries as well. I mean, you certainly hear a lot about it, you know, especially con construction labor and a lot of the a lot of the migrant labor in China is is specifically construction related, not actually in Xu Zhichan's stories. Um, but that is, I, I mean, I think I would, I, you know, I would say like a very large percentage of uh, migrant workers are are going to work in construction. There was actually one really short review that in auto translation turned out something. I'm 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 adding an adjective here uh, for effect, but it was something like just like the streets of Cairo, dark and desperate. I, oh. I've added the word desperate, but it definitely said dark and something. <laughs> but yeah, there was a reader who was drawing a parallel between the underclass in Cairo and Beijing, basically. So yeah, uh, it seems like you're on the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess I'm not surprised. That's cool. That's great. And I think, you know, that's one of the that's one of the things that appealed to me about Xu's writing in the beginning. I was like, well, this is very, very, very Beijing specific. But on the other hand, you know, these the story of young people moving to the city and and struggling to make their way, well, that's applicable in how many different societies, you know, at different different stages of different countries' history. Um, it really struck me as something that would be very, very uh, relatable for a, a wide range of readers. There was one review that mentioned a thing the reader liked about the book was that it showed some of the fluid fluidity. Again, I'm paraphrasing, trying to get it as close as I can by memory, but he said something like, it is a representation of the fluidity of life in your 20s, sometimes acting passively as an observer as much as an actor. And right. You know, I've never lived in the kind of precarity you're seeing in running through Beijing, but I did go through quite a lot of my 20s in Shanghai, kind of not slumming it, but having an easy come, easy go approach to my life. And yeah, it feels I mean, I've finished my third, I've finished my 20s now. I'm 30. And yeah, like some of some of um some of that post Dunhuang, the main character came out of prison. I came out of my undergraduate degree. I'm far more fortunate than he, but that sort of directionlessness and ambiguity before a yeah. structure comes falling down. And before, well, I've always had security, really, but before the security a structure can bring comes falling down on you, uh, yeah. being in a sort of that grey, loose zone, that that felt relatable. But I would never wish to compare myself to someone as down and out as Dun Wang. Sure, I never have to. sure. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I certainly one of the, the other things that really drew me to his writing was the fact that I was living in Beijing at the time. Well, I have, mm. you know, was living in Beijing the entire time. And, you know, a lot a lot of that time was spent living in Pingfang, the sort of places that he's living. Uh, and, you know, same as you, I really can't compare my life to his, but it, I was also I was making very little money and living in very uh, crappy circumstances. And, and just, you know, the sights and sounds that are described in the book, that's the, you know, that I lived in the midst of that. And so it, it was, it was very, very relatable. And it was, again, don't want to draw the parallels too strongly here. But when you say you're more fortunate than somebody in his position, the main reason is that I have a ripcord I can pull at any time. Mm -hmm. I can say, I've had enough of this. And I'm going to move back to the wealthiest country in the in the world. And you know, insert myself into a very wealthy society and probably yes. do just fine. Eric and so is I Swiss, have... everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, no, but uh, my friend, no, I'm, my... I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> my heritage is Norwegian, and they'd probably be saying, "Oh, oh you should really want to do return yeah. to the wealthiest country in the world?" Probably. Yes, should. thirty euros for a pizza. They must be wealthy. Yeah. <laughs> they must be wealthy. Um, so you know that option was available to me at any time, and and eventually I did exercise that option, and I said, "I've had enough of." this and i'm going back to a more comfortable circumstance um and so that that was that's sort of the heart of the real difference between uh well also the fact that and the fact that police were not chasing me um but there is a little a, a bit of a continued interesting correspondence there in that all of the migrant workers in the story have hanging over them the the possibility of moving back to their hometown mm. and this is for all of them this is something that's kind of like in the back of their head like am i gonna make it here uh, do I want to make it here? What would happen to me if I went back? You know, would it be better to go or or to stay? Should I go or should I stay? And they're all thinking in those terms. And it's very interesting to see, you know, different characters taking a very different uh, point of view on that particular question. And what's what often happens in the in Shujishan's stories is that, 
often the 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 female migrants are a little more they're more interested in going back. It's like, you know, I'm here to make some money. And then once I've gotten a little bit of security, I'm going to go home and start a family. And then the the male characters, it's much more tied up with their pride. It's like, I came here to, you know, conquer the big city and I was going to, you know, make my way in the world. And, uh, and it's much more like, I can't go back because I'm going to look like a failure and I can't look like a failure. Uh, and I will be a failure in my own eyes. I'll be a failure in my family's eyes. You know, so I'm going to, and many of them are, are, you know, they're in the city, they're pretending that they're successful. They call home and they're like, oh yeah, I got a great job making a ton of money. You know, it's great. Everything's going great. And in fact, they're barely scraping by. Uh, they're miserable. They just don't want to be there, you know? And some of them in the course of all these various stories, these various characters, some of them achieve the Holy Grail. You know, they get a, a Beijing Huko, some like one, one, one character notably just by marrying a Beijing woman. Uh, some of them stay and do okay financially, but never actually become part of, you know, Beijing life. They never become Beijing part of, part of become, ah, they stay and do okay financially, uh, but they never actually become part of Beijing society. Others stay, but are desperate to go back. Uh, they just won't let themselves and, and still more just say, you know, never mind. I've had enough. I'm out of here. I'm going to go back and even even going back to becoming a farmer in the village that I came from would be better than this miserable floating existence, uh, this sort of half life that I have here in, in Beijing, and and that is it's like going back to a rural lifestyle is the you know it's kind of the nightmare that's hanging over everybody's head. It's like oh my god, it's, and they keep reminding themselves this life is terrible in here here in Beijing. I hate it here, but it, God, it beats you know having. A, a little plot of land back home and growing sweet potatoes or whatever the hell. Uh, so that's, that's really one of the big kind of, do I stay or do I go? That's one of the big questions that's hanging over all the characters and all these stories. If you've only got 20 yuan to your name, that's enough money to hop on the Metro and walk through the richest district. Even yeah. if you can't participate in the life of that district, although 20 yuan would also get you a Jianbing. And I noticed that uh, that was in one of the Goodreads reviews. Someone said, this just really makes me miss Jambing more than any book I've read. Yeah. Street level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. And back, you know, he's writing at a time when the Jambing were like literally one Kwai or two Kwai. Um, and 20 Kwai, man, you could, you know, you wouldn't have to go hungry for days. That can that can feed you if you're willing to just eat Jambing and maybe big sweet potato. And those are actually pretty good. I moved back to Seattle here where there's a very large contingent of uh, uh, Chinese Americans and also you know, re recent Chinese immigrants. And I live near the University of Washington where there's a lot of Chinese exchange students, a lot of chain Chinese restaurants in here, around here. And I saw a Jianbing place opened Ooh. a few blocks away from me where the Jianbing were $11. <laughs> I was like, I am never in my entire life going to pay $11 for it. I don't care what well, you could put Kobe beef on there or whatever. I don't, you, I don't care what you put in that. A, a, a Jianbing is not $11. And I'm just not going to eat it. And that's like, that goes against the entire, it should be made by a crappy, in a crappy little cart by the side of the, the road, like maybe at the exit of a subway station. And there should be somebody like cramped in this little cart with their little, their little hot plate and they make it. And it's a, a choir to choir. I don't know whether it costs in Beijing these days, but there's no way it's no $11. It was just shocking to me. Anyway, I had to rant about that. I know I'm happy to join in when I was in Edinburgh, which is the first place I went after uh, after leaving Shanghai doing my publishing masters, there was there were some really good places to get legit like mainland Chinese food. Um, but they were all like restaurants, so you're paying UK right. prices for those. But there was a cheaper place, relatively speaking, on my walking route into uni and also to uh, the job I later got that year. And it was mostly just British style, um British Chinese style fair like salt and pepper chips and stuff but they did have a few more like they had a, a beef noodle soup that was a bit more uh, recognizable and they mm -hmm. had a a jianbing i think they called it a chinese pancake or something but it was so full of meat it was like bulging and it's like this is nice enough this is a nice jianbing but like you can't it's be this chunky no uh -uh, uh, right. no no it's not meant it's not like a hamburger in disguise it's you know it's it's very much its own thing and it can have you can have it, you know, you need an egg and you need whatever that crunchy wafer thing is. I once got in a big argument with somebody who was for sure it was fried pig skin. And I, and I thought it was a, some sort of a tofu product. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm still not 100% sure, but you need to have that crunchy thing in there. 
uh, and it stays crunchy until you got about halfway through the gem bing and then it gets soggy too. And that's just, I don't know, that's that's how you're supposed to eat it. It's just the way it is. I know, I know that we should talk about the book, but I have another experience like this I want to relate. So this was returning from a trip to London, you know, famously affordable place, London, um, <laughs> near the near the train station. Oh, this was the trip where I went to meet uh Murong Shwetsun, actually. Oh, cool. So oh. it was yeah, it was a nice way to round off the trip. Just near the train station I was going back north on, I noticed that there was a little uh, Chinese uh, cheaper place to eat uh, where it wouldn't have been weird to go on my own. And it was a uh, Shanxi uh, style food. London's mm-hmm. a sort like London, there might be like one Shanxi style place outside of London in the UK, but really for specific stuff like that in the right. UK, you got to be in London, basically. Unless right. it's Sichuan food, like Manchester has Sichuan food restaurants or it's least... the only allowed regional cuisine is is Sichuan. that's like the only uh, dim sum you can find dim sum oh, okay, where sure. i'm from scotland's yeah, yeah. fourth biggest city has a fairly legit dim sum place okay. but yeah like um non-hong kong stuff uh you got really i think london or somewhere you get you get lucky elsewhere but anyway there is this small cheap ish place i think it was called it was called murger han like what? m like the word burger but with an m and then han <laughs> like don't, and I realized once I was inside, a murger was what they had decided to dub the Rojia Mo. So, oh, yeah, Chinese burger. So, it's the Mo burger, the murger. Mo burger. Oh, I see. That so sounds I did, terrible. That just does not roll off the tongue. Did it taste all right? So, I didn't have a, I didn't have a murger. I had a Liang Pi. <laughs> okay. Which was great. Oof. But yeah, I don't remember what the prices were. I think I was blotting them out because it's like, yeah, didn't yeah, want yeah. to remember paying like one or two pounds for Liang P or 50p right. for Liang P right. in China and then forking out 10 times that in London. Just right, you know, when you I have th- a traumatic event early in life and you can never remember it, <laughs> it's just like a gap in your memory that just you just pass right over. I think this is totally on topic because so much of the story is about street food. I mean, yeah. it's it's the the uh, don't I the the soybean milk and it's the Sweet, potato, sweet potatoes and the corn and everything. Just the worst corn they used to have sell outside of the... That was when... Uh, all of it was great, but the corn, it was just like steamed to death. It was mm. like corn that had been steaming for five or six hours. And it had just turned into this like starch, mealy starch product with no flavor. That was the one thing I wouldn't eat, but the rest of it was delicious. Mm. What was your feeling about tea eggs? Oh, love tea eggs. I would eat embarrassing quantities of tea eggs. Like you're you're supposed to have it as kind of like a supplement to something else, but I would, mm. I would just get tea eggs. That's more eggs than you're supposed to eat in one sitting. I thought they're delicious, and that is something that benefits by sitting in the pot for five or six hours, uh, you know, as the commuters go by. Corn, corn, not so much. Okay, corn thoughts to one side. Would you like to give us a really quick summary of what happens in running through Beijing? So we've established our main guy is Dun Huang. He's been released from prison. He goes into sort of precarious work. You can. I don't know if we want to spoil the plot or not. I don't know how much there is to spoil, but what else would you want to spell out? Yeah, I. I mean, I don't think there's not like some huge. As long as you don't. Anyway, there's not a whole lot of spoilers uh, yeah. possible here. I think the main things to know are he shows up. Uh, he works again, as you're saying, gets a job through connections, through family, um, through people from his from his part of China. He ends up with the mostly illegal job of helping. A counterfeit identif- a counterfeit ID seller paste ads. So he's putting up advertisements uh, for his uncle, who may or may not really be his uncle. Uh, and the uncle's job is making all kinds of you know fake driver's license, uh, diplomas, uh, permits, basically any kind of identification you might want. Uh, they make a fake one. Interestingly, they do not. We've been talking about Huko, the the holy grail of living in Beijing, and uh, my understanding from the gathered from the various stories and talking to Xu himself is that nobody really dared make fake Huko. That was like too oh. that was too big a deal. That would be like making fake passports. Like if if you get caught doing that, it was going to be uh, it was going to be much worse for you. So a lot of it was driver's license or um, diplomas. I think are a fa- are a favorite because you can sort of pretend that you have this educational background that you don't actually have when you're applying for a job. Anyway, right. so um, so Dun Huang's main job is pasting these ads, and that's a a line of work that continues into the stories in Beijing Sprawl. Those guys are all um, advertisement pasters too, and I remember this, you know, from living in Beijing. Actually, in the area of Beijing, in the Zhongguancun neighborhood, 
where this is set. Um, when I went to school in, in Beijing, that's the area I was living. And you would see everything, these little square white pieces of paper, sticky stickers basically stuck all over everything, the ground, the telephone poles, uh, railings everywhere. And it would say Ban Jia Zheng, and there'd be a phone number or something. And so that's what he does for a living. And so a lot of the story is mostly, you know, it's him trying to find a place to live. It's him meeting some girls and, you know, his, you know, very, with various varying degrees of success, he has sort of romantic entanglements. Uh, he has his buddy, you know, and they look out for each other. They're trying to stay out of jail and it's, you know, without giving away the ending, that's kind of, it's the story of him trying to, trying to find some sort of solidity there. Um, trying to find, find a place to live, find a steady income, uh, find a girlfriend, find a little sense of identity really uh, in this, you know, this life, this life in Beijing and the difficulties he has do doing that. I'd say that's, that's my like hand introduction to the plot. All right. Um, it's, I can say for listeners as well, it's, it's pretty short, pretty breezy. I saw the people who had things critical to say on Goodreads were saying the characters are not described in a great deal of depth, which, you know, that's subjective i could see where they're coming from there was one bit i would definitely contend with where a couple people said it didn't really give enough description of the atmosphere of beijing although i wonder <laughs> if this is something if you've been lived you know if you've walked on the streets in a big or medium-sized chinese city this might be a nice well if you live there and still or if you're from there it might give you a sense of the familiar if you're someone like me or you eric it might be a nice waft of nostalgia i don't know yeah it's hard to know when you when you're sort of familiar with the thing it's hard to know it doesn't take much to evoke your own memories so it's hard to know if there was maybe not not enough description but it was enough for me because i i didn't need much um and maybe somebody who's never seen the city maybe they wouldn't know but like there's so much in there about the the dust and the grayness of the mm. streets and the you know and the dust storms in particular and i think there's some place where he describes the sun as looking like a like sort of a dully pol polished bronze disc or something in the sky. And that just instantly, instantly brought me back to the the dust storms where the dust the dust was so thick you could look right at the sun and it didn't, you know, it didn't hurt your eyes at all. It just looked like sort of a, a yeah, like a round disc of color hanging in the in the sky. I just found that so, so evocative and so right. So I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe you, you could have done more. Um, but I I agree with you. I certainly found it very very powerfully evocative of Beijing. As far as characterizations go, you don't find out much about what people look like. I think it's really mostly done through dialogue. You know, it's mostly the way we get to know the characters is is how and what they talk about, uh, which I I find sort of like the uh, more interesting and a more genuine way to learn who a person is. Uh, yeah, you know, by by listening how they talk. I mean, the the name in translation is running through Beijing. I think is that a is that a literal translation of the Chinese? Yeah, pretty much. Pao Ooh, running through Zhongguansun. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's more like jogging through Zhongguansun, which <laughs> is sort of nicely alliterative. But I think we thought would make no sense. Like Zhongguansun, nobody knows what that is. It looks the word looks terrible in Pinyin. It's like a mile long, and it's got all of the letters that nobody knows how to pronounce. Yeah, that C uh, is not going to sound good in English. No, uh, -uh no. <laughs> so the whole thing just was like. And they're not going to know what we're even talking about. I mean, if you call it Beijing, at least uh, they stand a fighting chance of sort of knowing this is going to be a book about China. So I think we decided that running through Beijing was was all, all things being equal was sort of a safer title. For our next edition, I'll humbly, humbly submit Jongging. Jogging Jong through oh, Jong. Oh. <laughs> Jesus, a title only a translator could love. There'd yeah. be about 10 people in the world who would actually appreciate that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, just, I was going to say... Um, because I hadn't read this one in a while, I thought I would get the physical copy in front of me. So I went up to my attic where all my books live. Um, yeah. And I'm looking at page one here because I glanced at this um, not long before I got Zoom set up. And yeah, the two things you mentioned, the dust and the sun are right here on page one. So I'll just read yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, go for it. Okay, here we go. I'm out. As Dun Huang opened his mouth to shout, a dust devil rose up and filled his eyes, nose, and mouth with fine grit, obliging him to sneeze and rub his eyes. The little iron gate clanged shut behind him. He spat the sand from his mouth. The dust devil, the dust devil had already moved on. Tilting his head back, he looked at the sky, a blur of yellow dust behind which the sun glowed, mild but... Oh, sorry. A blur of yellow dust... 
a blur of yellow dust behind which the sun glowed, mild but rough, like a polished piece of gro a ground glass or a copper mirror that had seen years of years of use. The sunlight had no power to dazzle, but it still made Dun Huang's eyes tear up. It was sunlight, after all. Another dust devil leaned toward him and he dodged out of its way. It was a sandstorm. He'd heard of them on the inside. The inside being prison. So there it is. There it is. That was, yes, my uh, my memory had sort of uh, had simplified it a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, what a what a perfect description of the sun through a sandstorm and brought a copper mirror or whatever. Mm. I, I want to take us to the next section, but um, I can't resist talking about Zhong Guansun a bit. Uh, the, it's come up on the show before when I did an episode on Chen Xiu Fan's Coming of the Light, which is a sort of a as its starting point has the sort of Chinese China Chinese tech, yeah, like tech scene uh, where a strange event sort of emerges from. And I think on that episode, I made a point of talking a bit about Zhong Guansun, which I think is known as the Silicon Valley of China. And yet it's also just a district in Beijing, right? So it's not right. as simple as saying this is a place where all the tech businesses are. No. Uh, and it was, so when I moved there in 2001, it was not, yeah, I mean, it was not, it was not the city center. Uh, it, let's just put it that way. It was, it was, it was one of it was one of the outskirts of the city. It at that point was the tech center of Beijing only because that's where the electronics markets were. So if you were going to buy right. a camera or some electronics or whatever, you go to these enormous buildings that were full of just stall after stall of like whatever. You could buy anything, you know. Just you could probably construct your own robot robots uh, out of out of stuff you could buy in those markets. But it was also very much not. I mean, when I was there, there were still donkey carts. Uh, God, I sound oh, like wow. ancient. I sound like, it's not that I'm ancient. It's just <laughs> the things of like, you know, Beijing has accelerated through probably about a century worth of history in, in, in 20 years. So there were donkey carts. There were, you know, people hauling fruit in from the, um, from the outskirts of the city. Uh, there were the Uyghurs with, uh, there used to be a lot of Uyghurs there. They had the big fruitcake carts on fruitcakes and they would cut a piece and then try to charge you a bunch for it uh it was very much like this is you know not a modern 21st century city and they, that'd be right next to the you know the the stalls selling nikons or whatever and so as time went by they got rid of the got rid of the donkey carts got rid of the uyghurs too uh and then it went from being sort of you know digital malls to like production companies and then uh, you know, software companies and all that sort of thing. You know, gradually, yes, turned into what I suppose you could call the Silicon Valley of China, if you were really straining for a correspondence. Yeah, if you needed an article headline. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I guess the the Sun in Zhongguan Sun is for village, right? Yeah, right. So, right. I mean, it was a village because it's outside of the you know outside of the traditional um, city walls of the of Beijing. So it was one of the. Uh, like Sanli Tun, you know, was a Tun that was also a village, and Zhongwen right. Tun is a Tun. So these were the little villages outside of the, outside of the city walls, outside of Beijing proper, and they just got sort of absorbed by Beijing as it spread. A sprawl, you might say. You might even you might even say that you might even say that the original title of uh, of that collection that we called Beijing Sprawl was uh, Beijing Xijiao Gusha, so Western stories stories of Western Beijing, stories of the Western mm -hmm. suburbs of Beijing. I tried to get them to call it West Side Stories, and nobody nah. just nobody would take that. I couldn't. Uh, we couldn't get anywhere with that. Crazy. I know. I don't understand. So eventually, uh, Beijing Sprawl was it, and and I, I like that. I like that title. I think it works. And a lot of the you know a lot of the descriptions too are there. You know they're on the edges of Beijing. They can't get into Beijing Central. They can't live there. They can live at the edges in these crappy neighborhoods with these crappy houses. And they spend a lot of time, the characters in Beijing Sprawl spend a lot of time on the roof of the of the place that they're um, um, living, drinking beer and eating chuar and basically looking at the city. And from where they stand, you know, the city looks like this kind of, it's variously described as a, a tropical jungle or a cancer or, you know, whatever, anything that spreads uh, Beijing is, Beijing can be compared to anything. Excuse me as I open the new tab and book my flights immediately to <laughs> yeah. Sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm missing the chuan, the char. Oh. Anyway, um, we were using some uh, some vocab, some Mandarin vocab there a second. Excellent, because I want to use one of my well, it's like one of the show's 
legacy pieces of vocab. One of the first words I learned after having started this podcast was uh, Leo Mang because that's uh, that was a movement or a, a happening in Chinese lit in the past. Not, yeah. I don't think it's a thing anymore, really. But it means something like hooligan, uh, troublemaker, and it was appropriate enough for the start of this podcast because it, I did start off with a bit of a rogues gallery of well, not just naughty boys, but naughty boys, rebels. Uh, so I wanted to ask you this precisely worded question. Where okay. does this book, that being running through Beijing, but you could throw in Beijing Sprawl as well, where does this book sit among works for the likes of Wang Shuo, Murong Xuetsun, Lu Xun, Dingling, etc.? Et oh, wow. Oh, that's a hard question. You could say not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> at all. It's interesting because in some ways, the this book in particular and Xu Zhichan's early writings uh, fit, and I don't think this is his explicit project, but um, fit better with the original remit of socialist realist writing, mm. which is to faithfully represent the lives of the lower classes, the working classes, the laboring classes. And obviously, when you talk about you know social socialist realist art, there's a whole sort of aesthetic bundle of baggage that yeah. comes with that. And Stalin that does not apply. Of, Stalin sort of did away with the realism. That's that's right. That's right. So I'm not I'm not saying that it has anything to do uh, with that those specific aesthetics, but like what he's doing is really just bringing you face to face with the lives of of people at the bottom of society, and there's very little uh, there's very little of a authorial project beyond that. Uh, it's not didactic. He's not beating you over the head with anything. You know, it's not moralizing. It's very much just like, here is what I saw. And here are the lives of these people. And that's one of the things that I found so refreshing because I think oftentimes um, Chinese authors feel like they need to add a whole bunch. You know, it's not real literature unless you're telling somebody about something or telling somebody what to think about something. And I found uh, I found these stories by Suzu Chen very refreshing because he was just like, here, you know, here they are. Uh, and I really found that I, I found that impressive. You know, you're talking about Wang Shuo and the Liu Mang, Liu Mang Wen Xue, uh, sort of thing. And he had his own project, which was to go against the other project and to piss everybody off and to like be provocative and be deliberately uh, unpleasant and sort of to, you know, it was a negation of what came before. And so he had his own, just as much as the socialist realist, he had his own um, aesthetic project that he was putting into his writing. And so I think, again, Xu Zhichan doesn't really have that. He's not, mm -hmm. you, you could read this, you know, every writing is some, in some sense, it's a, it's a reaction against what came before, but reading his early fiction, you really don't get the sense that he is, you know, killing his fathers or like throwing off any shackles or like, you know, fighting against some earlier tradition that he feels the need to overthrow. You don't, you, you don't really feel that. You really feel like he's, this is just observed reality. Uh, and so that's one of the things I really appreciated about his writing. Yeah, there's two kinds of cool, I suppose. There's the cool of, you know, you're on the rooftop, you launch yourself off the rooftop backwards, giving, you know, flipping the yeah. bird, smoking exactly. a cigarette, or you could be sat on the rooftop chewing your uh, kebab or tron. Yeah, and just looking at the it. looking at the city and writing about what you see. Yeah, and you don't, he just, he's not mad. You know, you read the stuff and you don't get the sense that he's like angry about anybody. He's just saying these are, you know, these are these people's lives. It's really, um, it's really compassion more than anything else i think that drives his writing at this stage anyway i well, i've only read one thing by ding Ling, and it's um diary of miss sophie which as i understand it is nothing like what her literary project went on to be um she was much more of a sort yeah. of well you know i i learned that even after coming out of um prison she was very dedicated um good you know capital g capital s good socialist but right. um diary of miss sophie I think you could say has something in common with running through Beijing, not because it's about hard scrabble, um, uh, precarious working people trying to get hookos, but it the the Miss Sophie really seems like she's going through her presumably twenties, a little bit lost, a little bit um, directionless, not even necessarily trying to figure herself out, but just stru structureless, and right. I th and it, I think also it does. The action does take place in Western Beijing, I think. So, oh yeah. Oh okay. That's interesting. I hadn't yeah. uh, I hadn't drawn that connection. Different. Generations. Yeah, I think any, but any, any writing that's closely observed enough 
I think we'll arrive at some sort of genuineness, some sort of, you know, some sort of reality. As long as, as long as you're writing what you see and not what you think you see or not what you think other people should see, uh, you know, when they look at these subjects, I think you can't help but, but paint a true picture to some extent. Sure. Yeah. Oh, by the way, um, I know I, I shouldn't be tangenting too much. Have you seen Wang Shuo has uh, entered Twitter? He's got a Twitter account. Good Lord, no. He's like retweeting just random crap. It's great. Oh, man. I'm I'm over Wang Shuo. <laughs> I mean, that that makes me a little curious, but not curious enough probably to go look at it. There was I... like a video of a really cool freaky bug. Oh, well, that's sort of on brand, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay, enough of him. Next question. <laughs> um, I think we basically already answered this one. The question was going to be, is there more to this book than just the thrill of well-written misbehavior? I think we've talked more about the um, sort of the realist depiction of difficult lives. So instead, I'll ask you, mm -hmm. what naughty behavior is in this book? Does that add to the appeal? The thing that surprised me a little bit about, about this and about Shu's other writings and surprised the editor a little bit, I think, is uh, what a prude the main character is. <laughs> uh, and I think that we, you know, he has some sexual experiences. They're not, I don't think they're anybody's definition of racy. Uh, you know, I don't think they're actually going to get your heart beating. In his other writing in Beijing Sprawl, there are even more awkward sex scenes, uh, even more awkward than running through Beijing. Uh, and I think that it's it's an interesting sort of juxtaposition against what we in the West might consider the normal the normal lives of people at the at the you know the the lower sort of the lower parts of society. You kind of assume everyone's hard drinking, you know, especially if you've got kind of like a you know a semi criminal job here. You're probably rough and tumble. You're probably a tough guy. There's probably a lot of like casual sex and people mistreating each other and all this sort of stuff. Um, and that doesn't quite fit into the, these characters and their lives. For one thing, they're pretty young. So most of the guys in these stories are, um, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, that kind of, that kind oh, of right. range. Really? Young. And don't, most of them don't have any sexual experience and, you know, they just come from a society that where, where sex is not that normalized and you're not, it's it's still sort of naughty. It's still sort of bad. The specter of the Liu Mang is still hanging over society, and so it, it, there are places where Dun Huang kind of freaks out. You know, like a girl comes on to him and he kind of freaks out. He's like ah, you know, and it's very much like a little boy reaction to it. And I think that that was uh, that was surprising to me, and it was surprising to the editor too. He was sort of like, why is he reacting this way? And I kind of had to explain that you know he's just he thinks girls are icky, <laughs> you know, and, it, and, and I think that's a, that could be a surprise for, for us, you know, with the kind of writing that we're accustomed to the kind of stories that we're accustomed to. So there's, um, there's a lot of illegal behavior. There's a little bit of awkward sex and there's kind of, uh, you know, young men tentatively taking their first steps into adulthood here. Yeah. One of the, that's one of the things I remember more about the book is the relationships Dun Huang has with, however many female characters he meets and it like i think the the main one i forget her name but if i'm remembering right he move, he's looking for his old friend and ends up hitched with his old friend's girlfriend, girlfriend. in a sort right. of ambiguous what are we type relationship right and it did feel to me like oh yeah this is like a if this was um written a few years later this would be like a tinder relationship like a <laughs> Right, but then there's a sort of other end of the spectrum. I remember quite well. He's got a some kind of a delivery type job, and he ends up having like a through the door, under the door crack sort of conversation relationship with a woman That's who right. seems to be a bit more economically well off, and but not mentally well or something like that. And I thought, That's oh, right. Yeah, at this the, is at, interesting. At that point, he's he's selling pirated DVDs, mm. uh, and so he goes from pasting ads for. Um, Pasting ads for these fake IDs, which is which is very illegal, to selling pirated DVDs, which is only a little bit illegal. Well, some of it's porn, right? Yeah, some. Of, well, that's the illegal part. So, if you want to really make some money, but you're willing to take a risk, then you sell the porn DVDs. But if you don't, you sell the regular DVDs. And so, he his big innovation and in the sort of the source of the title of the story is that instead of just sitting by the side of the road with like your you know, your wares spread out on a blanket like everybody else. He's going to combine his earlier expertise with pasting advertisements with his new job of selling DVDs. And he's basically like a pirated DVD delivery service. And he starts out on foot. So he's running through Beijing. He's he's jogging through Zhongguan Sun. And later on, he gets a bike. 
And so one of his repeat customers is this woman who is living, you know, uh, like you say, obviously of uh, a woman of some means, potentially you kind of get the sense that she's probably a kept woman of some sort. She's somebody's girlfriend, doesn't come out of the apartment, is bored in there all day, is watching pirated DVDs. And so he's bringing her and they have over the course of several interactions, they have, um, you know, so they sort of make a connection of some sort but instead of like you know another a different type of story where they go in and they have wild sex and then that's like a, a big exciting scene in the story the whole thing stays very innocent uh it's kind of like below the surface uh there's some tension some sex some sexual tension some sort of romantic tension uh and then it moves on she's she's no longer next time he goes to deliver movies she's not there anymore that's right. so that's very sort of the hanshu the like the kind of restrained storytelling style of the whole story the whole book Say la vie, it's your 20s. Maybe she moved yep. house, maybe she's been carted off. You'll never yep. know. You'll never know. Yeah. Um, question for you. So an awkward one to throw right after I've asked you about the character's misbehavior, but do you <laughs> vibe with any of the characters in the book? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm not so sure. I, again, my memory is limited. We, we certainly learn a lot about Dun Huang, but I feel like we get mostly from going from memory we get more like other people from his perspective. Is that right? Yeah, I would say that's I would say that's accurate. I still feel I would still feel most of most of connection with Dun Huang, mostly just because I mean he enjoys himself and he enjoys himself in Beijing. Like life is hard. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't have enough money. He might go to jail. But he is there's a real he pleasure in his just experience of being on the streets. And running through the street brings running through the city, delivering DVDs brings him pleasure. Getting a bike and biking through the streets brings him even more pleasure. He's just happy being out there and being in the city. Uh, and I think that was that's the thing that um, felt most directly, you know, powerful to me. It's like I, you know, I felt that same way. I was on the street. I was also biking around. I didn't really jog, but I was biking around, and I was just happy to be in that city and like seeing life go by me. Um, and that was that's one of the most powerful, powerful parts of the story for me. Totally, life's for the living. Yeah, Laowa generational divide here. My mm -hmm. one of my happiest moments in Shanghai and indeed other places in China I lived or visited was riding around on a mobike. Uh, oh yeah, the orange rental bikes. That was that was the life. That was fantastic. <laughs> if the traffic wasn't too bad, uh, a mobike in in heavy um, electric bike traffic is a bit scary. But generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the, maybe I was about to say that you got the fresh air. You've not necessarily got the fresh air. Not quite the fresh air. Yeah, but at alive. least a breeze. <laughs> at least it's moving. And yeah. when I first got there, you know, there wasn't that much uh, car traffic yet. There were no e-bikes. I was actually riding a forever, like one of those old, it wasn't actually a flying pigeon, but it was, <laughs> might as well have been a flying pigeon. It was a Yongjo thing where the, you know, the the brakes were, uh, Instead of brake cap instead of brake cables, they were they were actually just bars that sort of so the whole thing was real, I don't know, definitely felt from a different era. Uh, I could fly on that thing. Nice for the living. It might be snatched away. Cycle safely, enjoy yourself. Yeah. Brake yeah, yeah, safely. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'll take us to the questions that are about your work. Um mm -hmm. did running through Beijing present any translation challenges, aside, of course, from how to translate the title. Yeah. Um, I think most of it was uh, the the book, as you noted, is pretty short uh, and keeps up a good pace. Uh, right. And as I've mentioned, a lot of that is dialogue. And so the whole thing snaps along pretty quickly. And it's it was just real necessary to keep, uh, you know, both the, both the prose, but especially the dialogue, keep it moving. And sort of hear that rhythm of speech, uh, the back and forth, the exchanges, and to make sure that the dialogue came off uh, sounding like people actually talking. So a lot of that was when with sort of more long-winded prose you have as a translator you have more leeway of like nipping and tucking and you can sort of let it out here, you can tuck it in here and nobody really knows in the end that you've made some alterations. Uh, but with his writing it's it's very spare. There's not a lot of hmm. not a lot of leeway. There's not a lot of wiggle room. So you really have to you have to make it conform to that rhythm and that was probably the hardest thing to do particularly with the speech so i did a lot of sort of reading out loud of dialogue uh and just trying to get the snappy like back and forth there's a lot of real quick exchanges and so that you know that stuff is hard was any of that uh, affected by the fact that chinese is quite concise and 
things are a little bit longer in English or not so much? absolutely and it's always no it always becomes hardest when the um when the Chinese is the is the briefest right uh, and especially with the dialogue you know a lot of these responses are like one character or two character Bang. and then and you just hear these you can hear just this sort of like a grunt in Chinese it's just like Bang. you know and that's a perfectly sufficient statement you know that's enough dialogue in Chinese but we don't really make such short statements in English. And then if you turn it into something that somebody would be likely to say in English, then it just doesn't have the, doesn't have the punch of the Chinese. And so that was, that was definitely a challenge. Yeah. I definitely think a challenge. If I was reading something that had pretensions to being literary and there was a line of dialogue that was, Hmm, the letter M three times, I'd be like, yeah, this doesn't feel highbrow. You're right. Yeah. I, when you said about dialogue, I, I just opened it at a random page and I've got absolute an, a winner here. So okay, I'm just, great. I'll just read this. Before he could finish, her temper flared. Just shut up, will you? Do you want me to buy a movie or not? She hurled her newly lit cigarette onto the carpet, which began to give off a strange smell. I'm sorry, I didn't mean anything by it, Don Huang said, turning to leave. Your carpet's on fire. I know, she shouted. <laughs> exactly. So you just, you really need that sort of, a lot of it is very cinematic. Uh, actually, a lot of the whole story is very cinematic. There's a lot of, you know, you know, visual construction of scenes, even shots. Um, but definitely like the dialogue is something you could imagine being filmed. Awesome. Okay. Second translational question for you. Do you think a work like this challenges the average Westerner's idea of modern China? I don't think it, I mean, my experience over the past you know my career as a translator is that um western readers don't actually have that much of an idea of, of mm -hmm. modern china uh if they have, some people just almost have no conception of china at all uh some people have a conception that's very much stuck in like the maoist you know cultural revolution era yeah. what i usually say is I just say it's not yeah. North Korea. It's a consumer society. It's not North Korea. And people, you know, people are still asking, is it like North Korea? And that uh, that happens less and less. Uh, you know, Western media has been paying much more attention to China over the past, I don't know, 10 years or something. Uh, so there's definitely been a long period of people paying more attention and getting more nuance. But, but no, like in the end, no, people don't have a very clear sense of what's going on over there. And... I, I mean, again, I think if you write a story with enough detail in it and anchor deeply enough in individual characters' lives and, and thoughts, I don't think that matters because you're seeing, well, this person is in this situation and I know what he's trying to do and I know how he feels and I know why he's making the decision he's making. Um, so it doesn't really matter to me that I didn't know that selling pirated DVDs or like fake IDs was a thing. Uh, you know, I don't understand the geography of Beijing, but whatever. This guy's running through it, selling pirated DVDs. That's good enough for me. So yeah. I think as long as the stories are anchored firmly enough in characters, um, it doesn't matter that much. I think um, what you said earlier about the the sort of line when it comes to fake IDs, um, where the who the who huko, I almost said huja, which would be passport. The uh, the huko and the passport, where the huko marks the line uh, beyond which you don't you don't try and transgress the law. But everything yeah. under that is worth the risk and like you know semi-legal pirated well pirated dvd stores were still or possibly pirated dvd stores were all over shanghai when i was living there i'm sure they allegedly alle allegedly yeah. pirated yeah yeah <laughs> and it, you know it's not hard to imagine well maybe maybe in the digital age less so but yeah there's plenty of quasi-legal things that do go on in, in china and i think i would i mean i was surprised when i went there how many things were like whether legal or not or trouble with war like there was such a casual attitude to so many things that i didn't expect and yeah sometimes it was legality illegality like the right way to get your papers signed which maybe this police office is more lax than that one so we'll cross the county line I, exactly or yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. you can come in on a tourist visa switch to a work visa things like that are far more lax or you can drink a beer on the street. It's more lax than the UK. But then of course there's other things which you just don't mess with. And I think maybe right. you're and my feeling is your average Westerner has an understanding that lots of things are not, are very strict, but they maybe don't realize that some things are very easy come easy go. I've talked to Chinese writers who have emigrated to the U S or, or Europe and said that they feel far more constricted uh, here or there than they than they did in China, particularly when you know the system, you know, and mm. and the things that you know you have your contacts, you have your resources, 
and maybe some of these things that are difficult for other people are not that difficult for you. And it definitely when it comes to stuff like pirated DVDs, like it's it, in all of these things, it's not a matter of what does the law say? It's a matter of who's going to get mad about it. Right. Who are you personally offending with this? And if it's a law where nobody really has a personal stake in making sure that that law is enforced, then it probably won't be. And when it comes to pirated DVDs, who cares? You know, the film studios of the US and who gives a shit about them? They're thousands of miles away. They have no jurisdiction in China. You know, they have no, so there were, you know, and the film studios did get mad about pirated DVDs in China and they would, you know, come at it from a diplomatic angle and like, you might rah, rah, rah. And so inside China, they would make a show of like gathering up pirated DVDs. And there were times where they were making videos. They would have news reports of them running over like an entire parking lot full of pirated DVDs with a bulldozer and like crushing them all. And then they'd be like, look, and then here you go. And now away with you, you know, and that's as much as you're going to get a uh, recording film studios of America and, and, you know, to hell with you. So that I, you know, it would be sort of amazing that they would even do that much, but that would never impact the people who are on the street buying and selling the DVDs. Cause just nobody, it's not in anybody's interest to enforce that law. Who cares? I remember when I was living my first year in China, my other foreign friends showed me there. Oh, if you download a Chinese music app, all the music's up there for free pretty much all the music um right. and yeah i downloaded loads of music onto my phone via this very official looking app but i think it was a thing that did tighten and change a little bit um i noticed more and more things you needed like a paid account on the on the app to download it i tried use i think i was trying to use qq music uh back home in scotland after i this was at the end of my first year before i went back to shanghai and yeah i noticed probably a majority of the music even the western music wasn't free and then i think it changed i think more stuff was still not protected when you were in the country but so it wasn't it didn't become anything like uh, say the apple music store in the time i was using it but i remember seeing a slight shift in yeah uh, i think the the yeah. the move to like purely digital uh media and sort of greater interconnection between the economies of like the US, of mm -hmm. um, China and like the US and, and Europe and everything. Um, there, there, it used to just be this enormous gulf. Like, you know, you couldn't tell us what to do. We're way the hell over here. Uh, and now that gulf has been has been closed by uh, by digital technology. So there's they got a little bit more of a stranglehold on what's happening. And there's more there's a bit more responsiveness, which doesn't mean you still could, you know, I'm sure if you're inside China and you have a Chinese bank account, you can still download every MP3 ever made by anybody anywhere. Um, but it's more difficult. And it's, um, there's at least sort of a, uh, you know, there's a uh, motions are made to at least make it look like they're doing something. It's still a pirate's life for me, I have to say. But <laughs> Me too, man. I've sort of, I went legit. And now I'm back to piracy. Yeah. When I'm when I'm not struggling with my mortgage, I'll go straight. I swear. <laughs> okay. Um, miscellaneous question section time. Mm -hmm. um, I think this should be a, a fun book for this question. Could you suggest a Chinese word of the day for this episode? Oh dear. If you're stuck, we can put chuan chuan. We can put what? Chuan chuan ar chuan chuan. Chuan. Oh, like the. Chuan. Oh, some nobody's done that before. <laughs> I mean, what, you, what books are going to be kebab books? It's just such an important cultural... Uh, or we could do jimbing. Yeah. Or, or running. What do you think? Uh, it's Pabu. Pabu. What do I have to What do? I have to do? I just sort of say what the word give, is. and Give me a word. If I know how to write it, I'll write it myself. If I'm stuck, I'll be like, Eric, please type the word into the chat. Help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's do Pabu. Pabu. Let's do uh, Pabu. Okay. Yep, I've got it. Okay. Probably running. Cool. Um, running or jogging. Um, running or jogging. Yeah, Which do you yeah. think is so, more appropriate for the novel? Well, see, this is one of the reasons why I didn't want to use it for the title is because it's kind of, it's a little more down the middle. And when we say jogging in English, that instantly conjures up a lot. You know, that has a lot of associations of sort of somebody out for, you know, they got their short shorts on and their running shoes and they're going out for their health. Um, Maybe in your country. <laughs> whereas running you know running could be running for your life uh right and and paul Bu, i think is a little bit more ambiguous it's because he is he spends a lot of the story running just to get places he does enjoy it but he doesn't do it for his health and he also spends a lot of time running away from the police 
And so the ambiguity, uh, I don't know, I'm not saying it's totally ambiguous. Paul Bu is like not very fast running. Um, it's just not necessarily running for your health. But the amb ambiguity works a lot better just because there's all kinds of running in the story. Perfect. Okay. Next miscellaneous question. I hope I hope you're ready for this one. If not, don't worry. I've got an answer of my own. If you could set this novel to a piece of music, what would it be? Oh, wow. If you like, I can go first. And then maybe your brain will have an answer by the time I'm done. Okay. For some reason, I would also want to hear yours, but I did, I did okay. come up with something that's not going to be that good. But for some reason, why? I started, I just immediately started thinking of train, train spotting. Uh, right. And I thought of uh, that Lust for Life song. because of the rhythm of it and i could have totally imagined that music playing over scenes of him running through the streets choose jim bing choose uh choose don't want soon <laughs> choose porn dvds <laughs> exactly choose jogging. exactly yeah yeah great it's a fucking great television yeah exactly all right i <laughs> what's yours i, I picked um uh slightly more mo well not modern this is a song from an album that would have come out early early 2000s by a band called Glassjaw. I had gone around thinking the name of the song was pronounced Happy Those Milk. Yeah, so you can bet in mid-October I will still be ranting down most early I looked at the lyrics today. It's literally just ape because it has the word ape in the lyrics. But I, I will describe why I've picked this one. It's because it's not the most obvious connection. Um, it's got a very sort of um, to me, it feels like a hangover. It's but a hangover when you're in a sort of bittersweet. I'm happy, but I'm sad. I'm wandering around my my suburb or my favorite district of the city I live in or something. Uh, the first lines the lyrics are yeah it's over you can bet in mid-october mid i'll still be ranting about most early may it's got a the kind of a down and out kind of feel but also reflecting on one's past i i looked up the actual like what the song is about it seems to be the the singer of this band reflecting on his aggressive lyrics in the previous album which was like a sort of breakup album where he it's like that sort of ugly naughty thing from like rock and metal where the guy would be ranting about <laughs> my fucking bitch ex or something okay. and then in his second album i think he's realized oh shit i was i'm a worse guy than the guy who came after me uh, and like the last yeah. the last verse says how he's could like, you sorry. heal if you don't ease back the blame knowing you're right won't you heal how could you heal if you don't ease back the blame that doesn't yeah. really connect with running through Beijing, but I think like the vibe of again the thing I keep I connect with the book being huh. sort of directionless, being a bit of a fuck up, trying to trying to dig some self esteem and some self worth for yourself out of the ground. I don't know. In a way, 
That's no, in a way that, and in a way that's that's behind my choice of lust for life too. It's sort of like, well, our lives are bad and not the way that we meant them to be, but we are going to enjoy. We're going to do our best to enjoy it anyway. And there's a little bit of like, uh, this is all going to, you know, the, we're going to, the, there's going to be a bill to pay in the end, but until that happens, you know, we're going to, we're going to make the most of it. We're going to enjoy it. I think that makes total sense. Yeah. First half of my twenties, a lot of my thought process was, this is fucking great. This is so good. Life is great. <laughs> and then a lot of the laugh, latter half of my twenties, a lot of my thought process was, this is not how it's meant to be. Where is this going? What the hell? Yeah. And now my feeling is, let it be. It is what it is. Things are okay. They're far from ideal. So be it. And I think there's some of that in uh, running through Beijing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Listeners, me and me and Eric were talking about our mortgages before we hit record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about old conversation. people? Old, old people talking about their lives. Jesus. Okay. The next question. This is the bonus question. I don't think. I don't remember. I don't think we did this first time you were on the show, Eric. Basically, I snipped this one out and I put it on Patreon. Uh, so on the main episode, listeners will just hear, and then I'll say, guys, if you wanted to hear Eric's answer to this question, subscribe to the <laughs> Church of Thick Patreon. Oh, what if it's a shitty answer, though? What if it's not? What if they like subscribe well, and they're like, God, what? As it stands, there's 15 patrons, so you'd only be disappointing 15 people. Oh, that's good. I've disappointed far more than that in the past. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay, here's the question. I think this is a good one. What does it mean to be punk in 21st century China? Or if you prefer, what did it mean to be punk when you were out there in Beijing yourself? Because wow. I'm not expecting you to know what the, what the score is in 2023. I don't. Yeah. I certainly don't. Um, so what, is it, what does it mean to be punk or what did it mean to be punk in China and, and in Beijing and is Beijing special in this regard and I preface this by saying I would I noticed that a lot of China's rock bands seem to be Beijing bands mm -hmm. Shanghai did not strike me as well Shanghai struck me as kind of cyberpunk like there was a fashion scene it seemed like there was some kind of electronic music something but I got the feeling that despite being the grand imperial and indeed, communist capital Beijing is the scruffy punk. Yeah. Versus Shanghai. <laughs> Anywho, uh, I'll wrap up the bonus question there. Take us to the final questions. Uh, here's an easy one for you. If <laughs> listeners want more like this book, where would you direct them? Probably well, Beijing Sprawl, right? The, probably Beijing Sprawl. I'd be a fool not to not to answer that. Yeah. Uh, yep. Beijing Sprawl, out this year from Two Lines Press. It's with a spiffy new cover that they went and reissued running through Beijing with the new cover. So if you didn't like a close-up of an ashtray on the cover of your book, <laughs> which did did always leave a leave a faint taste in my mouth when I looked at the book, uh, you can get the new edition that has a 100% less uh, cigarette butts. Right. And I'll, I'll throw in a couple. Um, if readers or listeners rather if you read running through beijing and you enjoy the descriptions of yummy cheap food do mm. check out either of the books in translation available by murong shuetsun especially um leave me alone because that has descriptions of lovely cheap Sichuan food and cold beer far too many nice. bottles of it <laughs> okay. i don't know why it works on me maybe say something about how i spent my evenings in china but um yeah if you like if you, if you like your descriptions of food and drink go for that one if you like um the angst of being a uh, lost and confused 20 something or whatever young person i think you could do worse than dingling's the diary of miss sophie mm. it's kind of transgressive in his own way in its own way so that's where i direct listeners um my next question this can be one of too i suppose because sometimes i ask people what they're reading just now sometimes i ask them what they're working on just now i guess it might be in your case software what you're working on yeah unfortunately i uh it is a lot of software i am reading uh no joke calculus for dummies and a book on linear algebra um i'm also reading cormac mccarthy's the passenger because he oh. somebody recommended that to me several years ago and then he died so of course it was no not several somebody recommended it to me pretty recently and then he died so i was like okay there's a fine tradition of leaving an author's books uh, on the shelf until they die. So I'm reading that right now. So at least there is some fiction. 
in there. Uh, what I'm working on translation wise is the same thing that I have been not making any progress on for several years now, um, which is a novella uh, by an uh, author called Lu Yang. Uh, and I got a, I translated a short story of his called Silver Tiger or Silver Tigers, which was in The New Yorker, I think, in 2018. Uh, and I've got a longer uh, piece by him that I have a draft of. I just finished a draft of it, God, way too long ago. And I have not gone back and revisited the draft and fixed it. But that's ostensibly what I'm working on, though obviously I have not been, actually. Fair enough. I'll share what I'm reading as well. It is uh, it is a translated Chinese book, and it's from Hong Kong. It's Atlas, the Archaeology of an Imaginary City by Dong Kai Chung. Dong Kai Chung. Yeah, Dong yeah, yeah. Chung. cool. He's um, great. Yes, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Still not sure what I'm reading yet, but... Um, <laughs> Uh -huh, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a huge Google Maps enthusiast, and I'm feeling seen by this book. So, yeah, very, very Hong Kong, like very city, city focused. And listeners, if you've ever come across one of the writers who's waxed lyrical on what if you tried to make a map that was a perfect, perfect representation of the real world, and the map replaces the territory, some variation on that. This book is a very Hong Kong, very Relent, relentless, insane uh, extrapolation of that in the context of an imaginary Hong Kong. Very uh, Borges. Yeah, Borges. The author is not hiding the cards up his sleeve or his influences. It com it constantly references, or it repeatedly references Borges, Italo Calvino, and uh, Umberto Eco. So the guy knows who he likes and lets you know who he likes. That seems yeah. to be how that one works. Yeah. All right, that's the full extent of my questions for you. Is there anything we've not touched on you'd like to you'd like to mention about the book or about anything else? Oh no, not really. I think that that seemed pretty in depth. All right, yeah. Likewise, I don't think I got much more to hit on. I am fighting in order to just close my eyes and try and visualize all the street food and hole in the wall food I ate in various cities in china but you know what that would not be very that would be anti-social of me so. <laughs> this has definitely brought in a little wave of nostalgia i was done with beijing when i left in 2016 mm -hmm. and i was like eventually i'll be interested in going back which hasn't happened yet but i have to admit um talking about this book has gotten me as close to nostalgia as i've gotten uh for quite a while now mm. yeah i i left 2018 so didn't you know, it wasn't right before coronavirus hit, but I feel like I, uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I left thinking, oh, I'll go back one day, and then thought, oh, well, I can't really go back. It's it's in lockdown. I could go back now, but now there's no money for it, so it remains a fantasy. Right. I've my girlfriend who's never been or anything. I've I've described so many places that when I ask her where she wants to go, she says, "Well, I want to see pandas." So, so, well, I said, "Okay, that's great. Go to Chengdu. I really want to see Chongqing. We'll go there." But she's also told me, I really want to see Shanghai because you're always talking about it. It's like, all right, cool, Shanghai. And then she <laughs> says, well, I want to see the wall. And I want to see Beijing. And I was like, well, Oof. you could those two go together. So you could do Sichuan, Shanghai, Beijing. And then she said, and I'd like to see Hong Kong as well. And I was like, well, we no longer have a straight line. So... <laughs> this is a parallelogram. That's, mm. uh, that's turning into a long trip. Yes. So um, when the podcast makes me the millions, the Patreon millions, I'll, I'll be on my way. But yeah, Excellent. Any day now. Any day. Well, Eric, I'll say thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming back on the show. It was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to chat. <laughs> all right that's the end of episode 93 at the end of the interview rather and now you are listening to the end of episode 93 a very big thank you to mr eric abrahamson for coming on the show a pleasure to have you back i would say i look forward to having you back again but we're just what is it seven six eight i forget exactly how the counting anyway it's episode 93 the final one before i go on hiatus is going to be 100 and then i don't know when i'll be back after that so we may not be seeing eric again or maybe we will because i have some fiendish plans for the final couple episodes they're they're germinating plans as it stands you'll see listeners you will see i guess i should just do the plugs now 
not much else to do before I have to just run away and edit this thing. So what can you do if you like the show? A really good thing you can do is you can help cover the hosting fees. You can go up to the Churchific Patreon, um, sign up for as long as you like. You know what? If you've only got one dollar in the world to spare and you want to spend it on the show, do this. Sign up for one month, commit your one dollar, download everything on there. There's more than 100 episodes up there now. And then cancel. You paid one dollar, you got everything. Or if you want to support the show, stick around, help me cover the hosting fees. I'm thinking I will keep the Patreon running for a wee bit after we hit episode 100 because I'm going to keep the feed up so I will keep paying hosting fees. But honestly, like these episodes, as you may have noticed, listeners, they don't come out mega fast. So there's still a pretty long run before before we wrap up for me to go do other things with my life. Um, gosh, I said it'd be fast. I have not been fast. That's the Patreon plug. If you want to follow the show on social media or, or even myself, Myself would be on Twitter at Angus Likes Words. The show has an Instagram at Trichofic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. You'll see the occasional funny thing on there. The show also has a Discord. I am no longer trying to <laughs> embellish the Discord. It's very quiet. It is essentially dead. But if you want to drop a question there collectively for myself and other listeners, that's the best place to do it. You know, you could be the one that brings that thing to life you could be. There's links for all those things in the show notes, just check them out. And of course, the last thing I'll say is the best thing you can do for the show is spread the word. And you can keep doing this after I've hit the hiatus, because the episodes will still be online. I will not be taking them offline. Even if I was to shut down the feed, shut down the website, they're on YouTube. So they're here for posterity one way or the other. Anyway, tell your friends. Um, Tell your friends, tell your teacher. Tell your friends, tell your teachers, tell your Troir vendor, tell the guys selling your porno DVDs, tell your prison guard, tell a lot. And for me, I will say, Saijian. Hello.